Thanks very much. Uh, I'm afraid what I'll write is slightly longer than 25 minutes, but feel free to just interrupt me when you want. Okay. So I shall here focus on Penelope Maddy's book, The Logical Must, which was published in 2014, in which she approaches Wittgenstein's early in life philosophy of logic from the point of view of her own naturalistic metaphilosophical program, so-called second philosophy. As she explains, a second philosopher, the follower of such program, and I quote, investigates the world beginning from her ordinary perceptual beliefs, gradually developing more sophisticated observational and experimental techniques and correctives, eventually ascending to theory formation and confirmation, all in sorts of empirical ways usually labeled scientific. In the introduction, Maddy characterizes the book's aim as follows. And I quote again, the primary aim is simply historical understand Wittgenstein better, but the method is unusual. The idea is to use the second philosopher's view of logic to illuminate Wittgenstein's views on logic, both early and late. If successful, this approach, this a typical perspective, should serve to focus attention in unexpected ways and draw out less familiar features. Along the way, the process of compare and contrast should also reveal new aspects of the second philosopher's position, and this is the secondary aim. And in a footnote she adds, I don't believe there to be only one useful way of reading Wittgenstein, which is part of what makes his work so endlessly fascinating. So I give here readings that focus on logic, and that seem to me most interesting and productive when viewed side by side with the second philosopher's position. I could not agree more with the idea of there being different ways in which reading Wittgenstein can be useful or philosophically illuminating. And overall, I must admit that I have the utmost sympathy for the kind of strategy here adopted by Maddy, especially for our willingness to engage in the history of philosophy done philosophically. But I feel that if the characterization of her book's aims, quoted above, is to do justice to what seemed to me to be its actual achievements, it should have been put almost the other way around, somewhere as follows. The primary aim is to understand the second philosopher better, the idea is to use Wittgenstein's views on logic, or rather, views that have been attributed to him, to illuminate the second philosopher's view of logic. Along the way, the process of compare and contrast should also reveal new aspects of Wittgenstein's position, and this is the secondary aim, notably by expanding a position which was not his. For instance, I find a book like Wittgenstein to be illuminating for similar reasons. I had initially intended to cover, well, maybe I should skip this. I'll fo focus mostly on the tractate, I, I, I was going to say. Um, and as is the case with Mary, my aim here is twofold. Indeed, to understand Wittgenstein better, uh, but also to see where the second philosopher's roughly empirical account of logical truth uh, seems to me to fight. Our account is based on the claim that logic is grounded in the structure of our contingent world, and that our basic cognitive machinery is tuned by evolutionary pressures to detect that structure where it occurs. However, as I understand it, the Tractatus itself shows that the very idea of justifying logic with reference to the structure of reality, or anything else really, apart from sheer clarity and internal consistency, rests upon a confusion. Maddy endorses, as she herself puts it, a fairly mainstream metaphysical reading of the Tractatus, which she derives from David Peirce. Given that other readings of the book give equal or, or even greater emphasis to logic, it is clear that what makes such metaphysical or ontologically oriented reading attractive to her is the idea to which she sub subscribes that logic is somehow grounded in the structure of reality. The point of her discussion of the Tractatus is to preserve this initial intuition while converting the book's rather obscure metaphysical account into a straightforward empirical <coughs> work by taking a few naturalizing steps along the way. Before moving forward, it may be useful to recall a remark Wittgenstein once directed at Ramsey, which says a lot about his overall approach to philosophy. Not empiricism, <coughs> and yet realism in <coughs> philosophy, that is the hardest thing. As Cora Diamond points out, the idea here seems to be that empiricism is something we get into philosophy by trying to be realists in a non-metaphysical use of the word, but going about it in the wrong way. 
Diamond and elucidates this Wittgensteinian notion of realism by drawing attention to its ordinary non ordinary and non-philosophical uses, notably to what one usually has in mind when telling someone who, for instance, shows enthusiasm for an unreasonable or unrealistic plan or desire to be realistic or when referring to realistic novels or paintings, which are supposed to genuinely resemble reality. My suggestion is that the second philosopher's take on logical necessity is a good example of someone who gives an honest attempt at doing philosophy realistically, in this ordinary or elementary sense, but whose efforts end up falling short, largely due to a failure to free herself from certain unrealistic philosophical dogmas. I should also make now clear a guiding feature of the approach toward Wittgenstein's writings I have come to adopt, following those who seek to read him in a realistic spirit, which consists in giving primary emphasis to his metaphilosophical remarks. The point is basically that it is advisable to read all his philosophical writings in light of what he had to say about philosophy itself. In the case of the Tractatus, such principle has led me to approach the book in a non-linear way, starting out mainly from three different places that provide us relevant clues about how I believe that it should be read. The preface, Wittgenstein's self-acknowledged Grundgedanke, and the metaphilosophical remarks from 4.112. This by no means commit me, commits me to this idea of a frame of the book, which I've, I've never found convincing, and I'm not suggesting this is the only useful way to approach it, it's simply a way that I personally found illuminating. Uh, there are, of course, more. Uh, and I put the, the remarks, uh, philosophy aims at the logical clarification of thoughts. Philosophy is not a body of doctrine, but an activity. A philosophical work consists essentially of elucidations. Philosophy does not result in philosophical sentences, but rather in sentences becoming clear. Wittgenstein is insistent that he is not putting forward philosophical doctrines or theses. That this cannot even be done. Or that it is only through some confusion one is in about what one is doing, that one could take oneself to putting forward philosophical doctrines or theses at all, is as Diamond and others have taught us, to be taken very seriously indeed. Personally, I find the following definition of theory, offered by pragmatist literary theorists Stephen Knapp and Walter Ben Michaels, useful for understanding what Wittgenstein took himself to be impossible or confused. As, as they say, theory is the name for all the ways people have tried to stand outside practice in order to govern practice from without. This definition is also strikingly close to what Wittgenstein usually meant by metaphysics, the quest for ultimate foundations or justifications, as well as for absolute generalities. By following peers in, and ascribing a full blood of metaphysical realism to the Tractatus, Maddy seems to me to be walking on slippery ground. The main problem I see with metaphysical readings of the Tractatus has to do with how uncharitable they tend to be. But they seem to be comfortable enough in attributing the most blatant incoherences and paradoxes to it, while often simply bypassing them. Maddy takes the early Wittgenstein's master question to be, what must the world be like that we can represent it as we do? She thus takes the Tractatus's account of logic and language to be grounded on an underlying ontology, seemingly outlined at the beginning of the book. Language only makes its official appearance later, or so it seems. And this may indeed give us the impression that the ontology is prior. And it has to be conceded that several passages seem to support this kind of reading, as is the case with the rather baffling doctrine of simple objects, the alleged necessary substance of the world, on which the sense of our sentences, established prior to their actual use within our own linguistic practices, is set to depend. But then how can this be reconciled with Wittgenstein's subsequent claim after drawing a distinction between formal and formal concepts and proper concepts, that the results of operating with formal concepts, as if one were operating with proper ones, precisely what he appears to be doing with the, the opening metaphysical remarks, are nonsensical pseudo sentences. Someone like Gilbert Ryle, one of the first readers of the Tractatus to become dissatisfied with its metaphysical interpretation, had been well aware of this sort of tension, and I quote Ryle. Now, whatever may have been Wittgenstein's state of mind when he first wrote the ontological story, this is how he refers to the opening remarks, at least when he first revived the finished book, he must have seen that the ontological story is or appears to be doing exactly what is being forbidden in these passages, the ones I, I referred to before. 
He cannot then have thought that the ontological story was a legitimate premise or a legitimate conclusion in an inference to or from the proposition of the story. This is how he refers to the Tractatus as a count of sense. He must therefore have left it for some other purpose, and I suggest it was at least partly for an expository purpose. He was deliberately saying something that would not do, as a leading saying something that would do or nearly do. It is worth noticing that we hear progressively less and less of atomic facts, simples, simples complexes, etc., the further we read in the Tractatus. It was, I suggest, not his message, nor part of his message, but a sort of prefatory parable, end of quote. The discussion of this passage alone would have been more than enough for an entire paper at all, or more. Though I, what I want to retain from it, from it now is this impression that there has to be a way of reading the book which renders it much more coherent than its metaphysical readers take it to be. In other words, there has to be a way, or at least it seems to me, uh, to make the ontological story, including the doctrine of symbols, fit in with the, tracta the tractarian account of sentences, one in which the latter need not be explained by, appeal by appealing to the former. Again, following pairs, Maddy recalls how some key parts of the Tractatus are a reaction to Russell's evolving theories <coughs> of judgment, notably to the idea that since we can use words such as or, not, all, some, intelligently, we must be acquainted with the logical objects involved, which give rise to all sorts of problems, which unfortunately I cannot discuss here. <laughs> problems that, as Wittgenstein, also have certain tension in Frege's tensions in Frege's doctrines in mind, so, could only be removed by a correct account of sentences. Maddy, however, who herself quotes a passage from the, the 1416 notebooks acknowledging this last point, does not seem to me to give enough emphasis to the word removed and thus attend to some of its possible implications. Because if Wittgenstein's chief concern is indeed the removal, the dissolution of such problems, and considering the metaphilosophical remarks quoted above, then it seems plausible to think of his own account of sentences not as a doctrine about how things really are or must be, whatever that means, or as seeking ulterior foundations for logic and language, but as a particular framework designed for the activity of philosophical clarification, whose correction is to be measured not in terms of correspondence to reality, but as a matter of internal coherence, of removing logical inconsistencies and unclarities from our thoughts. This, I think, is what the Tractarian notation is supposed to do. Moreover, and as part of the clarification, the notation itself is supposed to serve as the perspicuous means of expression of Wittgenstein's own views on the nature of logic. On this point, I'm mainly following Oscar Ecluso. But this is not to say that Wittgenstein does have a theory of logic in the sharp sense of theory he rejects, one which is somehow encoded in the notation. He does not, or at least that was not his intent. What the notation is supposed to do is, 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 is what well, the notation sorry what the notation is supposed to express is essentially the view that there can be no such thing as a theory of logic in the sense of a substantial body of theoretical knowledge. Let me qualify these latter claims by comparison and contrast with Maddy's own understanding of these matters. Wittgenstein's Grundgedanke runs as follows. My fundamental thought is that the so-called logical constants do not represent. This is to say that from the point of view of the Tractatus, what Wittgenstein then took as the correct logical point of view, logical connectives are superfluous, perhaps even misleading. The notation itself embodies this particular insight, as connectives simply disappear there. Just think, for instance, of a conjunction P and Q expressed in a Tractarian truth table. Presented in this way, the connective ends can be eliminated, for the truth possibilities specified in the truth table rows are enough to make clear that what is expressed there is a conjunction. As for a case such as that of negation, a sentence not P, for instance, one need not add a negation sign to the notation, but simply take the truth table expressing P and reverse its truth values. For such reversal alone will constitute the proper expression of the negation of P. Tractarian truth cycles are themselves fully formed propositional signs. It was not Wittgenstein's intent to reform ordinary language, but to render the logic of our language in the clearest possible way, one which would prevent certain philosophical problems to appear at all. His aim was thus to bring out what we are already doing with language, 
not to teach us any new information. For instance, a truth table notation in which the logical connectives are preserved may on the one hand give the misleading impression that something new is being added to the sign, whereas the specified true possibilities are already its full expression, and on the other, invite philosophers into speculating about whether such apparently additional signs refer to some entity or are used conventionally. By allowing us to rewrite sentences in a way that makes connectives disappear and showing them to be dispensable, Wittgenstein was taking a crucial step in cancelling the path for both metaphysical realists and conventionalists about logic. It is as if the notation itself embodies his rejection of both realism and conventionalism by showing them to be beside the point. All this in turn hints at Wittgenstein's fundamental metalogical elucidation. Logic is empty, without content. It is pure form. What tautologies such as, if, such as if the switch is on or off and it's not on, then it must be off, show is not contrary to what metaphysical readers of the Tractatus of Art, some ineffable content or quasi-content, one is supposed to grasp somehow, but the knowing how involved in our everyday use of science. In other words, the whole of logic is internal to the logical character of any use of science which is also to say that there can be no appeal to something external to it, such as features of reality, in order to justify it. For every attempt at justificatory claim, we will already be relying upon the logical principles that we are trying to justify. To use an expression Wittgenstein made famous in his later writings, we are here at a point in which we have hit the bedrock and our spade is turned. We are at a point where we have exhausted our justifications. If the switch is on or off, and it's not on, then why it must be off? Then why must it be off? The philosopher asks. And here the most that I can say is, well, this is simply how we think. Which is our realistic answer to the so-called problem of the logical must. One we cannot imagine to be an answer at all. In case the philosopher keeps asking, but then why do we, do we think so? We find ourselves running in a circle. Notice that I cannot even say that logical laws justify our inferences. Rather, the elucidation of logical laws brings out what we actually do when inferring. No such thing as justification is involved here, other than the internal consistency of our inferential practices. Diamond adds, and I quote, If you think that the whole of logic is internal to any referring expression, you will see the Russell confusion wherever anyone treats any part of logic as external to what, one, to what we are talking about. Anyone who, like Frege, treats logical laws as holding of objects and functions will be imagining a kind of reference to, the ob to objects and functions, which, on our view, is an illusion. Given Wittgenstein's account of the character of sentences, it will appear that anyone who thinks of logical truths as genuinely true, anyone who thinks of logical truths as true because their truth conditions are met, will be in a confusion of the same essential character as Russell. He will be supposing himself to have access to what he is talking about, even though he is abstracting from the logical character of the science he uses to say anything. The idea of the science of logic is on Wittgenstein's account, nothing but illusion. End of quote. A science of logic is precisely what Mary's second philosopher wants to do, and she, goes in, she even goes as far as saying that had it not been for some prioristic in the Tractatus at least, and unscientific dogmas, mm -hmm. Wittgenstein would have most likely followed the same path. This strikes me as symptomatic of a misunderstanding of Wittgenstein, for it is as if she had overlooked the Grundgedanke's consequences. She does nevertheless glance at it in, acknow in acknowledging that, and I quote, the logical, the logical particles aren't names, they don't pick out symbols. There are no logical objects, as Russell had thought. thought. Rather, the particles indicate how the compound proposition carves the full truth table into the section that makes it true and the section that makes it false. But her subsequent remarks reveal that she has missed the point. In discussing tautologies, which according to the Tractatus say nothing, which is also to say that they are not, unlike sensible sentences, bipolar, and so do not carve the truth table in two, she writes, and I quote, in the hands of the logical positive, this idea, that tautologies are senseless, gave rise to the notion that logic is empty, without content, even conventional. But our metaphysical Wittgenstein draws no such conclusion. Though a tautology says nothing about the world, 
it shows something deep and important, the logical structure of reality. I think at least three mistakes can be identified in this passage. The first is that it is indeed Wittgenstein's point that logic is empty, without content, and that the positivists were only wrong in taking it to be conventional. Two, she seems to presuppose that the recognition of logic em logic's emptiness entails conventionalism, that it is the only alternative to realism, thus failing to see the intermediate way Wittgenstein himself sought to open. And three, she falls prey to the illusion that what is shown is something substantial. Her misunderstanding is also visible when maintaining that, and I quote, if it's either red or green and it's not red, then it must be green because once the, an the antecedents are satisfied, <coughs> the only remaining truth table rows may the, un the only sorry the only remaining truth table rows make its green true. Or to put it metaphysically instead, because once the facts representing the antecedents are obtained, the logical structure of the world guarantees that the fact <coughs> represented in the, con the conclusion will also obtain. In the first, logically on oriented formulation, she takes herself to be justifying the inference's validity by appealing to features of the notation, which on a reading are supposed to reflect features of reality as if failing to see that the truth table to which she appeals is nothing but the rewriting, in a more perspicuous medium, of it's either X or Y, and it's not X, then it must be Y. They are one and the same propositional sign. Her use of because here is out of place, reflecting a confusion. As for the alternative, ontologically oriented formulation, either one takes it as a paraphrase of the logical oriented one, or it ceases to be clear what she might even mean. Needless to say, that the use of guarantees reflects the same kind of confusion as the previous because, notably the idea that logical validity is to be justified with reference to something outside of logic. Mary's naturalization of the Tractatus involves reject rejecting what she sees as its two main unrealistic dogmas, the doctrine, the doctrine of simples and the doctrine of the priority of sense. Fair enough. I would have done the same for they are among the most problematic features of metaphysical readings. She does nevertheless virtually preserve all the remaining features of such readings. A naturalized Tractatus looks roughly like this, and I quote. Some Tractarian fundamentals still remain. The world is the totality of facts. A fact is the existence of states of affairs. The configuration of objects produces states of affairs. Logic is true of the world because of its structure. Along with this basic ontology, some rudiments of the picture theory also survive. We represent situations in the world, and successful representations share logical structure with what they represent. Without symbols and their attendant theses, with the reinstated ontology of ordinary objects and relations, there are good reasons to view such structure as the world enjoys to be contingent. Finally, a tautology sh does show something about the world, but what it shows is contingent and can also be said. It shows that this, this aspect of the world, it and its properties, has the structuring that validates the logical play. The entire theory behind this can be said, and we've been saying it here. And Again, it seems to me that these passages uh, show how, they are, how she has overlooked the Glunkedanka's main implications. She takes herself to be in for a realistic task, freeing the Tractatus, from an unrealistic metaphysical picture and converting it in, into a different naturalistic one, compatible, or so, she, or, or so she thinks, with our commonsensical and scientific procedures and beliefs. My suggestion is that she is still holding on to the same exact picture that underlies metaphysical readings of the book. She has merely altered its physiognomy slightly by giving an apparent scientific look, by giving it a new apparently scientific look. She thinks that there is a fundamental difference between claiming that the validity of logical laws arises from the structure of our own physical world and claiming that it arises from goings-on in some distinct realm of abstracta. But is it really different? Can you gesture towards such structure of the physical world? Can you point out the source of a rule of inference out there in reality? Her answer, I think, might have been something like this. Not yet, but cognitive science will sooner or later allow us to do so by revealing how exactly our, our minds mirror such structure. And of course, if it weren't for that structure, we could not even think. 
Now, this strikes me as exactly the same as saying that if it weren't for simples, we could not even think. And that analysis may very well reveal them one day. In another passage, Maddy rejects idealistic readings of the Tractatus, holding that it isn't that we impose structure when we represent. It's that, that representation can only take place when certain structures are present. This discovery, combined with the simple fact that we do actually represent the world, tells us something objective about the world and about our system of language. Unfortunately, I cannot here consider our assumption that it is a simple fact that we represent the world, which I find problematic. In fact, a misreading uh, of Wittgenstein, or a belief in the science of logic, may well be a consequence of a taking a representationalist picture of the mind for granted. Still, I want to press her on a particular point she raises in discussing ideals. How can we even tell, from our point of view in the world, the difference between imposing structure when we represent, and only being able to represent when certain structures are present? This leads us to consider a particular picture of the mind-world relation. We have the world on one side, the mind, or language, on the other. Both mind and world share the same structure, which is what allows us to cognize the world. The idealist holds that we cognize the world by imposing the structure of our mind onto it, while the realist sees things exactly the other way around. That is, our, minds come to come, our mind comes to detect the world's structure in order to cognize it. Now imagine the following Anselmian dialogue, in which A is the voice of correction, and B the voice of temptation. A. Now stand back from this picture. What do you see? B. Well, maybe two circles or spheres, mind and world, held together by a few lines of projection. A. Is that really all that you see? B. Well, no. I see two different pictures, in fact. One in which the lines spring from the mind and are projected onto the world, and another in which, on the contrary, the lines spring from the world and are projected onto the mind. A. Interesting. But then how can you tell that the pictures are different? Can you see the source and direction of the lines from where you're standing now? B. No, I can't. I just see the lines. Well, at least I thought I could see them. A. Right. So where do you need to stand now in order to see them? Silent. A. Where then? You told me you could see them a while ago. B. I don't think I can see them anymore. A. Of course you can't. B. Oh, I see what you mean now. The two pictures are in fact one and the same. A. You're right. Well, almost right. Can you still see the picture? B. Well, it seems as if it has vanished. I can't see anything now. A. Good. It didn't even vanish, you know. It was never there. B. Wow. That was kind of a crazy dream. A. It was, indeed. I'm just about to finish. Man insists that not only her theory can be said, but that she has been saying it all along. But if one has grasped the dialogue's point, then it may well be asked whether she means anything at all by her theory's central claims, such as logic is grounded in the structure of the world, our representational systems reflect that structure or the validity of logical laws arises from the structure of our own physical world. I'm inclined to think that she does not, for it seems to me as if she would require to step outside of logic, as it were, and have a glimpse at both mind and world from nowhere, that is, from a point of view beyond all points of view, being it clear to that I myself have no idea of what outside logic, glimpse from nowhere, or point of view beyond all points of view may even mean. To be fair, I do not think that they mean anything, at least in this context. I have merely used them as tra transitional devices, signaling that someone's thought has seemingly gone astray. Though no once and for all demonstration can be here provided, hence the dialogue instead of argument. My point can, thus be, can be put thus. What the second philosopher envisages as a plausible candidate, as, a, as possible candidates for empirical claims, strike me as propositions of first philosophy instead. Okay. To conclude, let me just briefly hint at an alternative way of naturalizing the Tractatus, which seems to me satisfactory, as I too think that there is no other intelligible way to treat logic other than as belonging to the natural history of clever animals like us. Get rid of the metaphysical stuff, all the talk of features of reality and so on, no matter whether Wittgenstein was ever committed to it or not, and preserve the notation, 
as well as all the relevant insights which are used to introduce and clarify the science and function, not as a canonical device, as Wittgenstein then took it to be, which was ultimately the Tractatus's downfall, but as one among other conceivably useful clarificatory models, somewhat in the spirit of uh, just outlined by Professor Kusala in, in the previous talk. This means preserving virtually the entire book while only leaving dogmatic commitments aside. That's what I have to say.